Hello everyone! Yes, I am cheating by doing this video before September is over, but I don't have anything ready to review this week and there are plenty of movies to talk about, so I might as well get ahead of the game and tell you what else I saw in the first half of September. And before anybody asks, yes, I got a haircut. Arf, arf! Movie number one is 2019's Jumanji The Next Level. The unexpected sequel to Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, which did so well they basically had to make another one. This follow-up installment has the kids from the last movie now in college, but one of them is struggling with the changes in his life and returns to the game. When he fails to show up for a Christmas break meetup, his friends figure out what he's done and go in after him. This adventure was just about as fun as the previous one, and I loved the new twist they added, with other people getting pulled into the game by accident and people getting the wrong avatars. What helped make Welcome to the Jungle so fun was seeing these actors playing exaggerated versions of themselves, but also kids who were their physical opposites. Now everything's mixed up once again, plus they throw Danny DeVito, Danny Glover, and Aquafina into the mix with hilarious results. I thought it was great. The humor, the character building, the action sequences. It had a good message and a decent, if kind of forgettable, quest to keep the characters moving. The effects were good, too. Obviously what we see is fake, but for the most part, it's pretty darn convincing. They left a window wide open for a third film in this sequence, and and I never thought I'd say this, but I hope they do it. Movie number two is Scorpio, a thriller from 1973 that stars Burt Lancaster and Alan Delon. Lancaster plays Cross, a CIA agent who wants out. He's gotten on the agency's bad side, he's been accused of double-crossing them and selling secrets, and is marked for death. Delon is Scorpio, a French assassin and sort of protege of Cross's, who the CIA now wants to use to get rid of him. The film co-stars Paul Schofield, who played opposite Lancaster in The Train, Joanne Linville, and J.D. Cannon. I enjoyed this one. I thought it was a good espionage flick where the main characters are neither good nor bad and you don't know if they'll kill each other or team up and turn against the CIA, which is the real scummy villain here. Like a lot of movies in this genre, the plot does get convoluted at times, there are a lot of characters to keep track of, but I think I managed to keep up. Lancaster is in great shape, doing most, if not all, of his own stunts in the action scenes, and Delon is smoking hot. Charming, smooth, rocking the signature white shirt, black tie look, the early 70s style flattering his figure, and the cats! His character has a soft spot for felines, which, goodness gracious, is adorable. Amazingly, I managed not to hyperventilate every time he came on screen. I watched this movie with my parents, and I do try to play it cool in situations like this, so I'm pretty sure my father was unaware of the real reason why I wanted to watch this movie. Of course, he knows now. <laughs> Hi, Dad! <laughs> By the way, I don't know if director Michael Winner was a fan of The Third Man or not, but the portion of the film set in Vienna seemed very referential. The streets were sprayed with water so they would shine at night, Lancaster's almost hit by a speeding truck, there's even a woman playing a zither in the background of one scene. I appreciated that. Movie number three is Carrington V.C., also known as Court Martial, from 1954. A distinguished war hero, played by David Niven, frustrated that the army is behind on his pay, takes money from the safe in order to make a point. He is court-martialed for the theft, and a courtroom drama unfolds where he must struggle to explain his questionable action. The film, based on a play, was directed by Anthony Asquith, who is most famous for adapting English dramas for the big screen. Carrington V.C. is a bit slow in the first half, but a well-done courtroom drama can be exciting stuff, and once things get going, tensions run very high. The whole production is simple but effective, and quite engaging thanks to the well-played characters. Movie number four is a modern classic out of Australia, 1975's Picnic at Hanging Rock. 
Set at the turn of the century, this film is about the disappearance of three schoolgirls and a teacher during an outing on Valentine's Day, and the harrowing effect the incident has on those who are left behind. The film, directed by Peter Weir, is based on a novel, but it's presented as a true story, or at least a story you wonder might be true. It's a strange, mysterious film. It doesn't fit in the horror genre exactly because it's not scary, but through much of of it, I felt an overwhelming sense of unease, especially in the build-up to the girl's disappearance. The sound design is truly unnerving, with a low, ominous rumbling that's hard to place. The aesthetics are potent, the film is heavy with romanticism and the suggestion of something otherworldly and elusive. Those who are left behind to wonder what happened to the girls are haunted by dreams and fears, wrestling with questions that get no answers. At times drifting into disturbing territory, there's an inconclusiveness about the entire thing, which led to some interesting post-film discussion between my mom and me. We both liked it, though at times we felt we didn't know what to think. But it's the kind of thing where I don't care to hear someone else's explanation or interpretation. I know this is a movie some people like to dissect, picking apart symbols and hidden meanings, but I'd rather not do that and just let the mystery and the mood resonate on their own power. Movie number five is 2019's Richard Jewell. The Clint Eastwood-directed drama about the 1996 bombing at Centennial Park during the Atlanta Olympics, and how the FBI and the press did everything they could to pin the crime on the security guard who found the bomb and was initially hailed a hero for saving lives. Thanks to the nature of its subject matter, this is a tense and frustrating movie. I expected it would make me angry, and it did. Richard Jewell, as played by Paul Walter Hauser, is a simple man, dedicated to his life's purpose and naive to a fault. Again and again, he's taken advantage of and not treated fairly or justly by the scumbags of the FBI and the media. There were good performances all around here. Sam Rockwell plays his kind but exasperated lawyer, and Kathy Bates gives a tear-jerking performance as his mother. John Hamm is the arrogant FBI agent in charge of the investigation, and Olivia Wilde is the scheming and very unlikable journalist who breaks the story. It's a well-done film, but so infuriating. Movie number six is The Host, a 2006 Korean monster movie directed by Bong Joon-ho, who won four Academy Awards last year for Parasite, including Best Director and Best Picture. I haven't seen Parasite yet, I wanted to see this movie first, even though they're not related. It seems like they might be, The Host, Parasite, but the translation of the original title is actually Monster. After a formaldehyde dump in the Han River, an organism mutates into a large monster and goes on a rampage. It carries away a young girl and her dad, plus his brother and sister and father, believing she is still alive, become unlikely heroes in a mission to find and rescue her. But to take things to another level, the authorities start quarantining those who have had close contact with the monster, saying it carries a deadly virus, and the girl's father is among those marked as an infected. For years, it seems, I've heard glowing reports of this movie, referring to it as one of the best monster films of all time, so my expectations were very high, and I hoped to enjoy it as much as I did Train to Busan, the Korean zombie movie. Unfortunately, even though I wanted to like the host very much, um, I came away feeling underwhelmed. The monster is interesting, its design is unique, and it gets more than the average amount of screen time, and there are a couple attack scenes that are really good, but its way of galumphing about on land was almost too humorous to be truly frightening, and the CGI is starting to show its age. There's so much going on, a monster, a virus, evil government, evil scientists, that the narrative ends up all over the place, plus it dips into nearly every possible genre. I don't mind blending genres, but in this case, I didn't find the comedy that funny or the horror that scary. I appreciated the different turns the story took, it certainly didn't follow the usual formula, and it had a lot of social commentary and satire to include besides. 
What was more of a challenge for me was that the featured adult characters were just so unappealing. Perhaps a language or culture barrier is partly to blame here, but I was put off by the exaggerated portrayals and the constant sniping between siblings. The little girl was the most likable character, and I enjoyed her scenes in the monster's damp, dark hole littered with decaying bodies the most. Going over the plot summary on Wikipedia, it sounds like a powerful and effective movie I would like, which leads me to believe it must be the execution. The execution didn't click for me. There were several good scenes, but all in all, the host didn't deliver for me what it delivered for so many others. I'm afraid I'm expressing some unpopular views here. I guess this is a good time to remind everybody that, hey, these are just my own personal opinions. Movie number seven is 1978's An Enemy of the People. Steve McQueen stars in this adaptation of an Ibsen play as a doctor who discovers that the local healing springs, expected to bring in wealthy tourists, are contaminated. Despite warnings, he publishes his report, which quickly turns everyone in the town, including his brother, the mayor, against him. It's a frustrating story about a man trying to do the right thing and help people, but the people won't have it. It magnifies the evils of the mob mentality, especially when that mob is kept ignorant of the truth and has no idea it's being manipulated by corrupt authority figures. I don't know which one made my blood boil more, this or Richard Jewell. Needless to say, this was a very unusual role for Steve McQueen. The beard, the glasses, the lengthy monologues. At the height of his career, he was hungry to get away from his on-screen image and set his heart on making this movie, even producing it himself. Unfortunately, once it was done, Warner Brothers had no idea how to promote it. They left it on a shelf for a couple years, then gave it a limited run in a couple college towns where it flopped. McQueen, crushed by the colossal failure of a film he'd poured so much of himself into, retreated even further from the Hollywood system he'd always rebelled against. What 1978 audiences didn't see is that McQueen is surprisingly convincing as the low-key but passionate and conscientious doctor who makes every attempt to fight the system. McQueen's supported by B.B. Anderson as his wife and Charles Durning as his brother. The movie itself is okay, it's a bit jumpy and distorted in parts unfortunately, but the drama, centered around dialogue and speeches, is not overly stagey and the tension builds nicely, culminating in a dark ending that is either uplifting or devastating depending on which final image you take away with you. And movie number eight is one that came out earlier this year, the last really big theatrical release before everything went nuts, The Invisible Man. This psychological thriller stars Elizabeth Moss as a woman who manages to escape from her abusive, controlling boyfriend, a genius in the field of optics. She's later stunned to receive news of his suicide, but she soon begins to suspect that his death has been faked and he's stalking her. The trouble is, she can't see him, and no one will believe her story. This is not a remake of The Invisible Man, it's not based on the book by H.G. Wells. Wisely, they surprised us all with a completely new story, though it does pay tribute by naming the antagonist Adrian Griffin, so you can pretend he's a descendant of the original Griffin if you want to. This film is shockingly good, with a tasteful display of great effects that give you chills and make you wonder how they do that. There are a lot of twists, several of them startling and therefore successful. Moss carries the entire movie pretty much by herself, with only a few other characters to interact with. No spoilers here, but I think the concept behind the invisibility is intriguing. I don't know if it's feasible or not, but it's cool regardless. In a way, I think the last section dragged a bit compared to what came before, but there's a shift to contend with. The tension isn't gone, it's just switched gears. Really, the whole thing is gripping from start to finish. And that's what else I saw this month, part one. Oh, and in case you're wondering, I am still watching Joey the Sea Otter's live stream. I am as addicted as ever, I would say, and I can't get enough of the little guy. He turned three months old the other day, and he's getting so big, but he's still such a baby, and I just love him to bits. If you're not in a good mood at all, you should tune into Joey and see what he's up to. It'll make you feel better.
I hope you enjoyed the video. You're welcome to share your own thoughts on any of the movies that I mentioned, even if you disagreed with me. So go ahead and share those in the comments below. As always, there's a list of the movies that I talked about in the description. Look for part two to come out next weekend. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.